here. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this second in our series of uh, Slow Meat webinars in the month of August. My name is Megan Larmer, and I work for Slow Food USA, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone here to, uh, to this webinar today. Every week, starting last week, we've been delving into some of the topics that touch on meat production and meat consumption in our current food system. Uh, this series of conversations grew out of the second annual Slow Meat Gathering, which happened last June in Denver, Colorado. And the purpose of that gathering and of the Slow Meat uh, community in general is to open up a safe space where everyone who has a stake in the future of food, so all of us really, uh, are able to work together to find solutions to this conundrum of industrial meat production. It's been really exciting last week with our initial webinar to open up this virtual space and to welcome, uh, welcome all of you online into the conversation as well. So today we've got a really, really great group of panelists who are discussing the topic of antibiotics in poultry production. Uh, leading our discussion is Gabriel Krenza, who is the Strategic Advisor on Food Procurement at the National Resource Defense Council and has been an important part of the slow meat community from the very start. Uh, joining him are Kathy Lawrence of School Food Focus, Suzanne McMillan of the ASPCA, and farmer Gray Gunthorpe of Gunthorpe Farms. Um, so just a quick note before we start, in the spirit of the slow meat community, these webinars are a place where speakers are encouraged to be candid and to be forthright about their perspectives and opinions to help build on this productive conversation. So uh, the views they express are their own, and they may or may not represent the position of slow food or of the organizations that they work for. Um, so we only have an hour for this conversation. I want to make sure to give lots of time for those listening and watching to ask questions uh, at the end. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can just type them into the chat box that is at the bottom of the GoToMeeting control panel on your screen. Uh, we'll be watching and collecting these and answer a selection of them at the during the last portion of the conversation. Okay, so without any further ado, I am going to uh, let Gabe Krenza uh, lead us in this conversation. Great. Thanks so much, Megan. It, uh, it really is exciting to join you all, and and I'm just so grateful to uh, get to play the role of facilitator and, and moderator today. Um, I thought first we'd go around and, and share um, brief introductions about ourselves. I'll keep mine very brief. Um, I joined the NRDC team um, a few years ago uh, by way of managing a cattle ranch out in Montana. I managed a ranch, grass-fed, grass-finished ranch out there for the better part of four years and um, have since been working with NRDC focused mainly on uh, developing strategies with uh, large businesses that uh, buy protein, so buy beef, poultry, and pork, um, and namely, most recently, and I think the slow food and slow meat community know me for the work I do with professional sports teams. I develop strategy with uh, teams from all the uh, major leagues in the U.S., baseball, basketball, National Hockey League, NFL, NASCAR, and uh, we're focused on helping them and supporting them to buy uh, buy better meat, and it, it dovetails into our national campaign, which is to really reduce the use of antibiotics um, in the meat production system. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, to Kathy to introduce herself, followed by Greg and, and then Suzanne, and, and also if you could speak on um, just where, it, it, within your introduction, um, you know, how your organization um, stands in terms of antibiotics use in poultry and, and um, the kind of maybe top level goals, and, and then we'll dive in from there. So thanks so much. Great. Uh, so thank you very much, Gabe. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm Kathy Lawrence, the Director of Strategic Development at School Food Focus. We're a national collaborative uh, currently working with 43 of the largest school districts in the country. Our primary mission is to leverage the knowledge and procurement power of those big city school food service directors to shift entire food systems in the direction of more healthful, more regional, and more sustainable foods. Um, so our core stakeholders are the food service directors and their staff in these large school districts together with the community partners that they work with. Uh, we do a lot of things uh, in terms of peer learning and communications and some policy work and our core thrust is on procurement. 
and increasingly we've worked uh, with multiple districts at the same time on shared procurement goals in what we call our school food learning labs. And uh, in 2013, about 15 districts across the country came together in our national procurement initiative focused on chicken. They selected chicken as a high priority because it is the number one protein served in school districts across the country by far. Uh, and they were looking for chicken that is both more healthful on the plate, meaning less processed, um, getting out ingredients of concern, looking for more whole muscle products, and also looking for chicken that's healthier in the environment. And they chose as their first step into that realm looking at antibiotic use. Uh, and so the primary problem they were looking at is the public health crisis of antibiotic resistance, which is what we're talking about today, and the fact that the children that they serve are particularly vulnerable um, in terms of antibiotic resistance. Children and the elderly in general are more vulnerable. And some of the school food service directors were coming at this from just a general knowledge of the problem and a general concern, as well as a sense that they had something they could do through their procurement out. And some of our directors had very close personal experience with antibiotics simply not working um, for loved ones when they needed it. So at any rate, we highlighted that issue and uh, really started looking at how we could get our districts chicken that they could trust. Um, that was dealing with the antibiotic use issue. And um, what we've come to over time is really a goal of completely eliminating the current norm for poultry production in this country, and that would be conventional chicken production, um, which is the vast bulk of all of the poultry produced in this country right now. Um, there's very little oversight, there's no information, no one really knows what's going on in terms of antibiotic use, what antibiotics are being used, how often, how they're being administered, and what the impacts are. There's just not a lot of information, transparency, accountability. Um, and so even though we're working with some of the most forward thinking school food service directors in the country, and many of them have been trying to get no antibiotic ever chicken for quite some time. At this point, those 15 districts are purchasing about 14 million pounds of chicken a year collectively. Only 4% of that is no antibiotic ever. Uh, and uh, we were really looking at how do we make available to public school districts across the country poultry that's raised with either no antibiotics ever or with very rare documented use of antibiotics that are important in human health. So really honing in on that human health issue. I think we're getting into some, some great issues right off the bat and we're going to explore oh. so, so many of them uh -huh. uh, just, just to be able to um, really get to pick some of these issues apart. I think we're going to save them the deeper stuff for a little later, but thank you so much. And we're going to, I mean, we're going to jump back into it. If I could ask uh, Greg, would you, would, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself as holding a unique seat on this, on this panel today? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Gunthorpe from LaGrange, Indiana. We're up in the northeast corner of Indiana. Uh, we have a um, family farm. We raise pigs, chickens, ducks, and turkeys on pasture. We have a USDA inspected processing plant on the farm, and our primary customer base is upscale restaurants in Chicago, Indianapolis, and Detroit. Um, if, if I dare, I would like to take a little bit uh, broader view and share just a few of my thoughts on the, um, uh, not just the um, chicken industry, but the um, eat industry in general in the United States and agriculture in general and then uh, tie that back into the issue at hand today that we're talking about uh, which is antibiotics and chickens. Uh, I'd like to share a few um, facts with people. Uh, most of them everybody already realizes but you know uh, um, food is uh, very cheap and abundant in the United States uh, probably to the excess you know the um, Average consumer spends about 10 to 11 percent of their um, budget on food. Um, you know that that's one of the lowest percentages in the world. Uh, it probably ties back into a lot of the problems that we're talking about because we don't probably don't spend enough on food. But, uh, United States agriculture produces about 30 percent of the world's uh, food. 
uh, yet it uses about 70% of the world's um, uh, resources. Um, you know, the, I've, I've always told people that I think uh, a couple of our biggest exports off from farms over the generations has been our topsoil and our farm kits. You know, we keep losing farmers uh, uh, astounding rates. Uh, you know, at the same time, uh, global agriculture uh, produces enough food to feed everybody abundantly well. You know, we produce about 3,000 calories uh, per person per day. Uh, you know, it's pretty uh, easy to see in the United States that at the same time we have uh, hunger issues, we also have uh, obesity and uh, nutritional problems tied to food. Um, talking about uh, the production of animals that is uh, good, clean, and fair. And uh, that, that's my, hopefully my role on the panel today is that uh, I'd like to talk about the responsible use of antibiotics in chickens, uh, but I'd also like to talk about that in terms of how uh, the antibiotic use in chickens is one step uh, to moving our whole chicken supply in the United States towards a more uh, sane and sustainable uh, poultry production system. Greg, thanks so much. Um, for that. Suzanne, would you like to share a little bit about the work you do and, and your organization's goals? Sure, thank you. And that's actually a great segue, you know, Greg's final point he was making. Um, because here at the ASPCA, first of all, just to say, I think a lot of people still don't know that the ASPCA is working on farm animal issues. So I just wanted to mention that we've had a farm animal welfare campaign since 2011. Um, so we're still somewhat new on the scene and, um, but, you know, we're really focused on factory farming, trying to eliminate the worst practices in animal agriculture and essentially raise the bar for standards. Um, and since the beginning, we've really had a focus on poultry and in particular broiler chickens. Um, and we've also had a strong focus on transparency issues. So. I think when you put those two things together, you actually arrive um, pretty naturally at the antibiotics in poultry issue. So um, we sort of honed in on this one early on. Um, and um, I would say that with regards to our work around this issue, um, first of all, our positioning is that we certainly distinguish between therapeutic and subtherapeutic use of antibiotics, not just in poultry, but, you know, in all livestock. Um, it's certainly important to be treated um, when needed, but when it comes to subtherapeutic use, of course, everybody knows there are human health concerns around that, but there are actually, um, you know, numerous animal welfare concerns um, in terms of health and sustainability ultimately for animals. So the way we view this situation is that subtherapeutics are essentially serving as a stand-in for adequate welfare um, for animals on farm. And uh, the welfare concerns we have really sort of break down into is so um, broiler chickens in particular are really selectively bred for very particular traits that essentially are pushing them to their maximum um, limits and that's creating real problems for them um, from a health and welfare perspective and the other side of it is the husbandry conditions in which they're living so both of those things need to be addressed and we're both very much at the crux of all of this because these birds would not be being raised with routine use of antibiotics if they were able to cope with their environment so there's obviously a problem um, systemically underlying the dosing and so what we would like to see and what our campaign called the Truth About Chicken partly focuses on is under is addressing the underlying conditions. So improving the welfare for these birds and um, you know around that what we're looking to do is educate consumers um, and have them um, lend their voices to the call for action for better uh, welfare for birds. We're looking to increase transparency in the marketplace around what all these claims and terms and labels mean when it comes to antibiotics. Um, we're looking for more meaningful standards in animal welfare certification programs as they relate to the use of antibiotics um, and again in particular requiring therapeutic uh, dosing as needed. Um, and then, of course, we're looking to continue to collaborate um, with our partners in the health sector, the environmental sector, um, and all the other, you know, worker justice, consumer sectors. Um, we've had a really fruitful collaboration so far, and I think this panel is a great example of that. So we're excited to continue to try to leverage collective power around this issue. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and I, I, I wanted to go back, um, Kathy. 
you began to raise a great point. I really, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I know that the the subject that you were uh, beginning to explore is one that I know is important and one we sh we definitely want to explore on the conversation. Um, you know, just to start off, I I thought we could begin to for the folks that have tuned in and the folks that will continue to in, tune into this when it's a when it's a um, a recording that can be accessed forever. Um, to us all sitting on this uh, on this discussion have a pretty deep um, and uh, in-depth understanding of the issues that underlie the use of antibiotics, but I think to educate our crowd, um, which we can assume has interest and some level of concern in the issue, um, what are the underlying concerns around uh, the current poultry industry at uh, at, a, at its current status quo? What are the you know, what are the health concerns? Uh, I know that uh, Suzanne Animal Welfare really kind of sits as a front and center pillar for you, and um, you know, Greg, it's probably probably also has economic productivity um, ties to it. But what are the underlying issues that fall under uh, antibiotics as a as a um, issue? The overuse of uh, today in the current industry that you're that you're really focused on uh, addressing? Uh, so I, I think very simply put, uh, the overuse, the misuse, the regular use of antibiotics, whether it's in animal agriculture or in human medicine, inevitably leads to bacteria developing resistance to those antibiotics. And so what we're facing at this point is the reduced effectiveness of some of the most important public health drugs available uh, in the world. And so the about everyone's seen the statistics between 70 and 80 percent of all of the antibiotics sold in the United States are sold and used in animal agriculture and generally as Suzanne was talking about they're used on healthy animals uh, for non-therapeutic reasons. And so the low dose use of antibiotics every single day in the feed and or in the water leads to uh, pretty dramatic uh, antibiotic resistance and then that can get into the environment through handling, through the water, through the air, through dirt, through manure, through all kinds of vectors and so you end up with antibiotic resistance moving throughout the environment and what we're looking at is re reducing antibiotic use, using them only when they're needed so that when they're needed they can work for both humans and animals alike. That's that's great. Thank you. That was a uh, a wonderful kind of foundational setting of the tone. Um, Greg or Suzanne, is there anything you want to add there in terms of underlying issues that this really kind of strong umbrella theme helps many organizations in this movement uh, approach the problem from different angles? I would just add that you know our perspective at the ASPCA is that these animals by and large are not healthy. That's part of the problem is that, you know, we hear a lot of messaging coming out, you know, healthy animals are being given these drugs, but they're not inherently healthy oftentimes. I mean, they're struggling right from the get-go with really unnatural genetics and um, really just um, unhealthy environments that they're living in, you know, poor sanitation, high levels of stress due to uh, crowding and lack of ability to engage in a number of natural behaviors, you know, unnatural lighting. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so we don't think that the solution lies solely in addressing the drugs that they're receiving. If we simply pull back those drugs without improving the underlying conditions that are leading to them essentially needing the drugs, just to in a way, if you think of it, um, be dragged to the finish line in order to be slaughtered, you know, we need something else to replace um, the current protocol. In our opinion, the most holistic and sustainable approach would be to uh, reform the system from the ground up. That leads to kind of another theme tying directly into to your last point, Suzanne. You know, if, if there is no alternative or strategic uh, pathway in lieu of reducing the use or ending the use of, then we we don't really stand, um, you know, to have, have much of a successful turnaround. But 
what are the what are the big this might be one Greg that you might want to try and tackle uh, first off being a, from the producer um, feel but what are challenges and concerns that that are associated with reducing uh, the use of antibiotics given that the system is so heavily dependent on them now production um, is maximized and uh, we are talking about you know, really having to change the ways in which animals are raised uh, within the, the kind of living conditions that require um, you know these these tools so that animals don't get sick what are you know what are the concerns if tomorrow we saw a law passed that just ended antibiotics antibiotic use in uh, in in the production system I guess I'd have a few comments on that uh, uh, it wouldn't impact us because uh, we don't use antibiotics on our operation but the um, you know antibiotics just like any of the other uh, chemical tools that agriculture uses uh, probably have their place, uh, but in my opinion, they don't have their place to uh, replace uh, poor management. You know, first of all, we have to manage the system to the point that the animals uh, have every single opportunity to be healthy. Uh, you know, on our operation, uh, we use uh, significantly lower uh, stocking densities. You know, the animals aren't uh, we, we raise our animals on pasture, so if one would get sick, uh, they tend not to make the whole group sick. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, weather challenges because every single day is uh, different weather. And, uh, you know, but the, um, we, we try to produce an um, environment that is conducive to the animal being low stress and, you know, green grass, fresh air, and exercise uh, for health in our animals. Uh, I think the current uh, livestock system would really, really struggle in the United States though if they just uh, immediately took antibiotics away. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, it, it's going to take a multifaceted approach. And I, I mentioned earlier, you know, the fact that we spend only about 10 to 11 percent of our uh, budget in the United States on food. And I think that's one thing that really needs addressed because. Uh, Raising animals uh, without antibiotics uh, costs more, and I think that's probably farmers' biggest concern: is that they're under really tight margins, and you know most of the chicken producers in the United States don't even make those decisions anyways. They're contract growers, and somebody else makes the decision of what goes in their feed or water. So, so I would just add to that, if I could. Um, for us at School Food Focus and the School Food Service directors, we're working with. Um, one part of the equation is really a, a social justice issue in terms of children's access to good quality proteins. Uh, and so working with these large high poverty school districts with very limited funding um, requires them to be purchasing basically from the supply that's available. Uh, and uh, they have purchased some no antibiotic ever. We're helping them continue to do that. The supply is extraordinarily limited and the price point is generally higher than the districts can pay unless all of the stars sort of align in terms of a regional producer that's nearby with low transportation that has a surplus product that isn't selling well in the retail market and the districts are able to cook and train their staff to scratch cook and handle raw chicken in the school setting which is really tough and so what we were looking at is given the fact that poultry production in this country is so concentrated and that we're so dependent as a nation on chicken in particular as a, a cheap a source of protein and that's not going to change overnight. What can we do to raise the expectation of how that poultry is produced in terms of antibiotic use? What's the level beyond which no producer should be using antibiotics? And so what we've been looking at is creating a certified responsible antibiotic use program uh, and certification by the USDA so that not only are the companies changing their practices and telling us that they're changing their practices, they're opening their doors to on-site audits by USDA auditors on a regular basis. Uh, and so we're sort of approaching this from all angles. 
small and local when that's possible. Sometimes districts can afford to do that once a year. Regional, larger scale when that's possible and sometimes districts are able to do that two or three times a, a month. Uh, and then looking at where can we go so that every school district in America knows that they're buying poultry that's raised with some minimum standard of antibiotic use in place that's responsible antibiotic use. So that's what we've been looking at. And it's, I, I don't know if folks know the figures, but we're, t you know, there are 163 million chickens a week slaughtered in the United States. And so looking at where the 97% of that chicken comes from and dealing with that system is one of the pieces that we've taken on in order to get better products to these kids this year, next year. Knowing that there's a lot more to be done at a lot of different scales and all of the worker rights, fair contracts, animal welfare, environmental management issues to work on as well. We're by no means done. This is a first baby step into this. So many great points there. Um, Kathy, thank you for, again, kind of alluding to uh, a wonderful next pertinent topic that we can, uh, I think all of us have <clears throat> some, and, and the listeners as well, have some experience in uh, the, the labeling conundrum and certification um, aspect of, of many environmental Ag products, you see a lot of success with uh, Fair Trade or Rainforest Alliance certified with um, to take into account sustainability measures. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, maybe Suzanne. You'd like to explore uh, the labeling piece when it relates specifically to this issue and and transparency in labeling. Greg, you might have a piece here as well since you don't use antibiotics. Uh, I'm curious. Um, if, if you've ever had an animal that's gotten sick and uh, you know, like what are, the what are the treatment measures there but <clears throat> back kind of to a broad question do you think that labeling in this space whether it's the responsible use of or antibiotic free do you think it sets up a tiered system that actually pressures farmers to um, without a system in place that would pressure farmers to uh, really be compromised in how they'd raise their animal to maturity? I personally believe that if there was an antibiotic that would keep animals to the point that they were uh, not uh, experiencing severe suffering or death and people wouldn't use it, I mean, that, that would be inhumane and cruel. Uh, but like I said before, to intentionally set up a system that you had to routinely give them antibiotics just to keep them alive is not right either. You know, it was touched on earlier that uh, we have to look at the a holistic picture uh, all the way from genetics, uh, the system that we're going to raise them in, you know, uh, biosecurity is very, very important, uh, you know, all of the components of building animals, immunity, uh, vaccination programs, I mean, there's a lot that goes into uh, making sure that you can produce healthy animals. Uh, without the use of uh, antibiotics. You're, you're actually having a bit of uh, connectivity um, issue there, so it might, be, it might be a good opportunity to share with or have Suzanne share if you have any thoughts there, Suzanne. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, you know, transparency has become a big theme um, around food in general. I think we sort of have a crisis of transparency going on right now in the U.S. in our food system, and we see that through the ag ag bills that are being introduced around the country, and too often they're passing, and you know, all sorts of uh, complications um, around labels, claims, you know, things that are quite confusing, either misleading terms, hollow terms, a lot of consumer confusion. Um, and so, you know, we feel that having an outside trusted auditing party um, can really help in situations like this, both for animal welfare reasons and to ensure that antibiotics are being used appropriately. And luckily, the leading animal welfare certification programs um, that are uh, working right now in the U.S. all have some sort of um, antibiotic oversight uh, protocols in place, um, which for the most part are 
uh, pretty strong because they require treating when necessary for therapeutic reasons and they disallow subtherapeutic use. So we think that's wonderful, especially because it's bundled in with animal welfare, which again is really an essential component to this larger picture because until we raise the baseline animal welfare standards, I think we're going to continue to find ourselves in this same situation where we're essentially trying to apply a band-aid to um, a very large wound that really needs a treatment at a deeper level, if you will. Thank you for that. Gabe, can I finish my thought here if my internet is working again? Absolutely, Greg. Absolutely. Um, Please take care. The other, the other comment I wanted to make was that um, I would highly recommend that people check out uh, Consumer Reports uh, website, uh, greenerchoices.org. I think it does an excellent job of explaining uh, most of the options that people have for uh, labeling terms uh, um, and how those compare across the board. Uh, the, other, the other tool that I think that is really useful for people in understanding some of these transparency issues is the Animal Welfare Approved uh, puts out a um, labeling guide uh, that gives the actual technical uh, legal definition of any term that can be put on a meat or poultry label. I'm, if I could, Gabe, could I just uh, talk a little bit about the specifics of our certified uh, responsible antibiotic standard? Absolutely, Kathy. This would be a great time to do so. Please. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask Megan to just put up a little image of our certified responsible antibiotics.org website, uh, which is where folks can find the uh, text and the details of the standard that we put together with the Pew Charitable Trusts and their uh, Human Health and Industrial Farming Initiative. Um, the crux of the Certified Responsible Antibiotic Use Standard is that uh, the use of antibiotics that are important in human medicine need to be rare, they need to be documented, they can only be administered not just with veterinary oversight but only with uh, a licensed veterinary prescription. Um, it can only be done in the presence of disease and um, we have worked very closely also, so for the next image, with the USDA uh, Ag Marketing Service. So Megan, if you could put up that next image. Uh, our school food service directors basically said, we don't want to have the option of verification. It needs to be mandatory. And so that set us on a journey of um, how do we figure out uh, what kinds of certification and verification and auditing uh, entities are out there to work at the scale uh, that these school districts are purchasing and so we're very pleased to be working with the USDA they are our third-party auditors in the field uh, companies that want to use uh, the certified responsible antibiotic use label and to make that claim have to submit a very detailed program manual to USDA that goes through a third thorough desk audit then there's a site audit uh, that is scheduled uh, I've been on one of those so far it was very in-depth it was three full days it goes through the feed mills the hatcheries the grow out barn the slaughter facilities, the further processing facilities to document that all of the pieces are in place, all of the people are trained, all of the documentation is in place, and all of the practices are actually being followed to meet the standard. Um, so we, we know that there are, there are various tiers of antibiotic use and one piece that I wanted to make clear is that no antibiotic ever um, is great. We're helping our districts get that. It's limited supply, it's expensive, and in and of itself it requires another stream because when those birds, if and when those birds get sick, and sometimes they do, not always, they have to be treated. They're going to be treated and then what happens with those birds? And right now the conventional market that I was talking about before and conventional production practices allow for zero transparency in terms of antibiotic use. So that's the, that's the floor that we're trying to raise to say we need to have transparency. We need to know that antibiotics are being used responsibly and rarely. Great. So that's uh, perfect timing. Um, you know, I, I see here that, that Megan has kind of opened the forum um, for all folks watching and listening to to ask this uh, truly expert panel some some questions. 
and it looks like Kathy, you were able to really wonderfully address um, Shannon's question around: Is there is there going to be a difficulty in securing supply, and yeah. um, and and is there demand? And certainly there is. So um, thank you for addressing that. Mara McKenna has a a question um, to all. It's more a, a comment that I think will raise a good topic, but. And given that there's been a number of large uh, production companies, uh, I think Purdue of, or Tyson of most recent, you know, these large vertically integrated producers um, have begun to make quote-unquote claims that they, they're going to uh, focus on their supply chain and commit to stop using quote-unquote medically important antibiotics. Um, is is there any backing to that in your all's view or opinion, or is it really um, cause for greater skepticism? Um, I'll start. I mean, those are some of the companies we're working with because, again, the scale at which these districts are purchasing is huge. Uh, and uh, again, where we come down is it has got to be third party verified. And uh, in our case, we want to see what what's the audit checklist, what are the audit criteria. We have that posted both on our website and on the USDA website so that it's clear. Um, Purdue has made changes and they've been very uh, clear about how long it took them. It took them 12 years uh, to go from whatever they were doing before to uh, a pretty significant uh, portion of their production being no antibiotic ever, which is USDA third party verified. And they talk about some of the things that Suzanne and Greg have been talking about before, the full management issues that you have to take care of. And that has to do with the stocking density and ventilation and litter management. Um, it also has to do with going up to the breeder stock and, and what you're feeding the breeders. It has to do with eggshell quality, all kinds of stuff. All of those things can be fixed and you can still produce at a very, very large scale. Uh, and just because I've been in some of those grow out barns and seen some of those facilities and then seen the very detailed records, I, I, I have a pretty high degree of confidence in the systems that have been verified where there are auditors in the field every six months to a year so it's not a one-shot deal. They're in those plants, they're in those grow-out barns, they're in those hatcheries on a very regular basis. Um, I don't put a lot of stock in claims that aren't verified, period. I don't put a lot of stock in pro pronouncements about things that are going to happen in two or three or four or five years until I see that they're going to third-party verify and that they're going to make those records available. And I would say one concern we've had in reading some of these announcements is that there's sometimes a focus on trying to identify other drugs that can be used in place of human antibiotics. So whether those are antibiotics that aren't considered medically important for humans, whether those are other antimicrobials that are not antibiotics, whether those are entirely other forms of drugs, you know, all of that to us continues to be part of the same model of raising these animals, which is just continuing to try to prop them up and sort of pump them full of whatever drugs they need to survive for just a few weeks before they can be killed. And that continues to point very clearly to the fact that we have a major underlying problem that is not being um, sufficiently addressed. Thank you. Megan, yeah, Greg, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to make one point on this. I, I personally believe that as we see the larger companies uh, start to at least, whether they're doing it or whether they're just talking about embracing the concepts of uh, moving down the path of sustainability, I, I think that's could have the potential of being very good for this industry. You know, if we look at the um, broiler industry in Europe compared to the United States, their, their whole niche uh, market is much more advanced than ours. And we're really in the infancy in niche uh, broilers in the United States. Uh, eventually, I think we'll end up with uh, 15, 20 percent of the um, birds in the United States are raised on pasture. Uh, I, I see this uh, steps of the big companies uh, 
reducing or eliminating antibiotics, uh, moving the whole chicken perspective uh, more towards sustainable production because the rest of the industry is going to differentiate itself further. So it could eventually be a really good thing for everyone. And I would I would absolutely agree. And I, I would just, for me, offer, a, a, in terms of the question that was asked, uh, I work a lot with theory of change in large businesses. And the fact that uh, five years ago, even less, maybe three years ago, this this topic was not front and center for many large businesses. It was not a health concern and the great work that the three folks are doing up here um, and many others are doing to just bring the issue and topic to light that what is the issue of antibiotics overuse in, live, in the livestock industry and people are beginning to connect the dots and understand. So again, even from a mark, you know, a language perspective to have this word be used by these large producers, and we're seeing it in the news. Um, as as Kathy uh, reiterated, it's so important to have a system of criteria in order to verify and certify in place that there's that structure. Um, but for uh, beyond that, bigger picture, more even a, a meta view of this, to be even seeing these this issue take place in national news is uh, of great help. So I would also chime in there. Um, Megan has a great question. Um, is there a way that you all up here, and I think this is great for our, our listeners, the, uh, that you would, uh, you as experts up here would recommend um, to eaters uh, ways that they could contribute to responsible antibiotic usage in poultry production? So Kathy, I know that you folks are coming out with uh, this really helpful and wonderful educational tool in a label. Um, are there ways that the common eater um, can continue to support this movement and knowing that it's a confusing world out there, what are some ways you might suggest? Um, so I, I, I think as in any sort of sustainable, just food issue, so also with poultry, uh, the ideal is to know your farmer and know your food. I think with proteins that can be difficult. Uh, and I think that uh, for the farmers that are producing like Greg is with all of the components in place, not just antibiotic use, but, but management and animal welfare and I'm assuming worker rights and all of those things, that it costs real money and that's not what our food system is based on so Greg started out with comments about we don't pay enough for food which is tough when you've got the kind of hunger issues that you have in the United States but the, I think the fact is you don't we don't pay enough as Americans for food at the grocery register at, at the point of sale but we're paying a heck of a lot for our food in terms of the environmental impact the health impacts, uh, all of the quote, you know, externalities. So I think for folks to be more and more aware, to really be reading the labels, to be looking for third-party verification that they trust, it requires some homework. Um, I will say that in terms of not necessarily uh, the highest level of responsible antibiotic use, but in terms of what we're setting as a very responsible standard, um, we have been working with two of the four largest poultry producers in the country, uh, and they have adopted the standard and have gone through audits and so that chicken's available to school districts in this school year. So that's going to be appearing on cafeteria trays and we're really proud of that and we're also working with uh, more large and mid-scale producers and even some smaller producers on this standard. Um, but for the time being it is not a, com a consumer label, it's not a commercial retail uh, label, it's for the school food service market at this point. Uh, so for the general consumer, um, it, it takes a little bit of work. I, I think Suzanne and Greg probably have more to say than I do about, about really understanding where your food's coming from and reading those labels that are out there in the retail market. And we have a little less than 10 minutes here. Any other questions? Oh, here we have Brittany here. <laughs> Brittany asks, do we have any favorite chicken recipes? 
<laughs> Chicken cacciatore is my favorite, but also, I, I don't know, actually I think my favorite is just a very basic roasted chicken with rosemary and garlic. Yeah. My favorite <laughs> way to prepare chicken uh, is when I'm roasting a pig. I like to throw some drumsticks or legs along the side of a pig for about the last four to six hours and let them uh, still uh -huh. roast the grill. That's my favorite. Wow. Okay, that might be my new favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't eat chicken, but there are lots of great mock chicken products out there that I would recommend. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I would say being a uh, being originally a New Yorker, I I have a soft spot in my heart for um, chicken wings, buffalo wings. But uh, you know, also working with food strategy, we see now broilers being such a, a and, and chickens that are genetically bred to have such large white you know, white meat breasts that it's it's really not a balanced animal. Um, I would encourage folks to explore recipes that really utilize the whole chickens and, and ones that would explore uh, wings and drumsticks because there is there's actually uh, quite a lot of them in the market that, that don't get used so from a whole from a whole animal standpoint those would be my recommendations find great recipes for dark meat <laughs> Well, I, one place to look would be the school districts that we're working with. Uh, the one no antibiotic ever item that they're able to afford is drumsticks because that's not one of the most desirable cuts uh, in the U.S. and it tends to be available. And so they've been developing some really great recipes. A lot of them post them on their websites. We've begun to collect those recipes. but. Um, I would say, Gabe, that we're raising a whole new generation starting this year and next of, of kids that are really into drumsticks. Uh, so you start them young and they'll keep coming. That's great. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to turn the mic over to Megan. I think she may have a, last, uh, a few last comments again. Thank you so much for your time, both the audience and the speakers. Really appreciate hearing um, really strong perspective in, in the work you're doing. So thank you. Yeah, I, I, I have to thank you as well. That was really just an exciting and interesting conversation. And thank you so much for bringing these really uh, varied perspectives to um, help bring a little bit of clarity to a topic that I think is really overwhelming and confusing for a lot of folks. They sort of dip their toes into it and it's uh, it's almost too confusing to keep going. So I think this conversation is so important and really made clear um, some of the major underlying issues around antibiotic usage, the, the uh, animal welfare, human welfare, economic issues. Um, and I love the idea that we're, we're getting kids going at a young age on um, a production model that can, or, you know, on a path that can really change the production mo model uh, substantively like we're all hoping for. So um, a huge thanks. I would like to ask uh, anyone who's watched and enjoyed this, if you are a social media type uh, and want to comment on it, please use our hashtag, hashtag slow meat. We'll have the final webinar in our series next week. Um, and I think for those of you listening today, it'll be really worthwhile because it brought up, uh, it addresses a topic that was raised frequently, which is um, that of labeling and labeling on meat in particular. And we will have uh, consumer reports joining us to to help walk us through that uh, tricky, tricky situation. So if you'd like to find out more about that and about the past uh, conversations, you can visit our website, slowfoodusa.org. We'll also be um, posting and sharing the recordings of these conversations so that you can uh, listen again and send them out to others who, who you think could benefit from learning this as well. Um, a huge thank you to all our speakers, and I would actually like to sign off, if I can, uh, with a quick little video of just what it might look like if we had the kind of farm um, that that we're hoping for. So let me see if I can get this to work. Give me just one quick second. All right, so this is a video of Greg's chickens uh, out on his pasture. And this is what it looks like when you've got happy, healthy birds who are not uh, requiring antibiotics just to stay alive. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you all next Thursday.